December 12th, the day of the first ball, dawned clear and mild, but by noon clouds had gathered and the wind had become sharp and cold. My gowns hung in Mandy's wardrobe. The glass slippers Char and I had found were safely buried at the bottom of my carpet bag. Since they'd be hidden under my petticoats, there was little likelihood that Char would see and identify them. Hattie's preparations began after breakfast and continued endlessly. It's not tight enough, Ella. Pull harder. Will that do? My fingers were striped red and white from tugging at her laces. If she could still breathe, I wasn't to blame. Let me see. She curtsied at herself in the mirror and rose, panting and smiling. I shall be desolate if you don't remember me, prince. She cooed at her reflection. Then she spoke over her shoulder. Am I not magnificent, Ella? Don't you wish you could look as I do and go to the ball? Magnificent. Ravishing. Yes, I wish I could. Anything to make her go. Pearls would set my hair off to advantage. Fetch them! There's a good girl. Two hours later, after Mum Olga called her three times and threatened to leave without her, she declared herself perfect and departed. At last, I was free to bathe and dress. Instead of the kitchen soap I usually used, I helped myself to Hattie's store of bath oils and fragrant soaps. Mandy produced a fleecy towel and a fine scrub brush. Tonight I'll be your lady-in-waiting, she said, pouring steaming water into the tub. When your servant is your fairy godmother, you're never scalded and your water never gets cold. You become sparkling clean, but the water never gets dirty. I soaked away a year of cinders and grime and mum Olga's orders and Hattie's edicts and Olive's demands. When I rose from the bath and stepped into the robe Mandy held for me, I was no longer a scullery maid, but the equal of anyone at Char's ball. My gown was a spring green embroidered with leaves of a darker green and plump yellow buds. Mandy had done her work well. In accordance with the latest fashion, my waist tapered to a narrow point and my train trailed two feet behind me. In the glass, I saw Mandy curtsy. Your lovely lady. She seemed close to tears. I hugged her. She squeezed me tight, and I inhaled the sweet smell of freshly baked bread. I turned back to the glass and raised my mask, which covered most of my forehead and half of my cheeks, with small holes for my eyes. With half my head hidden, my mouth appeared strange and unknown even to me. The transformation was thorough. With the mask, I was not Ella. Nor was I perfectly dressed. I had no jewels. My throat was unfashionably bare, but it would have to do. I didn't have to be the most elegant creature at the ball. I only had to see Char. When I ran down to our front door, I discovered that icy rain was falling in sheets. If I walked the quarter mile to the castle, I would be soaked. I could go to the ball without jewels, but not wet through and shivering. Mandy, what can I do? Oh, sweet, you can stay home. I knew there would be two more balls and that it probably wouldn't sleep tomorrow. But it might, and I had my heart set on going tonight. Isn't there some small magic, a fairy umbrella, something that would keep me dry? No, love. Not small magic. The weather was such a stupid thing to separate me from Char. Mandy hadn't made the rain, but she could have ended it. Oh, I wish you were a real fairy, one who wasn't afraid to do anything. I had a mad idea and acted on it without considering its wisdom. I said the words Lucinda had taught me. Lucinda, come to my aid. If anyone would think keeping me dry wasn't big magic, that one would be Lucinda. Ella! Mandy protested. Don't! The order came too late. Lucinda appeared between us. She still looked old, but she stood straighter than the last time I'd seen her, and many of her wrinkles had disappeared. Oh, 
Sweet child, you need my help. She smiled, and the young Lucinda shone through. So long as it's not too big, I shall do what I can. I explained. Going to a ball? Like that? No, it won't do. She touched my neck, and it was hung so heavy with jewels that it took all my finishing school training to keep my head up. Mandy snorted. Perhaps it's too much for small magic. Lucinda agreed. The weight vanished, replaced by a thin silver chain from which hung a white lily made of the same kind of glass as my slippers. I felt a slight pressure on my head and lifted off a tiara fashioned as a garland of the same flowers. It's beautiful. Lucinda placed it on my hair. Now, you need a coach. That shouldn't be too troublesome. How can you call a coach small magic? Mandy demanded. And horses, and a coachman and footman, people and animals. You've forgotten your lesson. No, I haven't. I won't shape them from the air. I'll form them out of real things. That should satisfy your scruples, Mandy dear. Mandy grunted, which I knew was not agreement, but Lucinda continued gaily. Earlier this evening in Frell, I spied a giant's cart filled with pumpkins. An orange coach would be splendid. A rumbling noise reached us. Outside, a mass, darker than the storm, took shape and grew larger. A seven-foot-high pumpkin rolled toward us and came to rest in the street outside the manor. I watched Lucinda. She muttered no incantations, waved no wand. For a moment, her gaze shifted, and she seemed to stare within, not out. Then she winked at me. Look, child. The pumpkin had been transformed into a gleaming coach with brass door handles and windows through which lacy curtains peeked. Mice will make plump horses, she said. Six fat brown mice raced across the tiles of the hall. They vanished, and six horses appeared before the coach. A white rat became the coachman, and six lizards were transformed into footmen. They're wonderful, I said. Thank you. She beamed. Mandy glowered. Anything can happen, you idiot. What can happen? I'll make it safer. Ella, child, you'll have to leave the ball early. At midnight, your coach will become a pumpkin again. And the animals will regain their original shape until your next ball. The tiara and necklace will disappear. I would have only three hours with Char. They would have to be enough. Ah, oh, how glorious to be young and going to a ball. Lucinda vanished. Glorious! Yes, to see Char. Nothing more. Goodbye, Mandy, I said. She ran to the kitchen. I stood impatiently and gazed outside. As I watched... An orange carpet unfurled itself and rolled from the coach's door to ours. If I waited much longer, it would be wet and useless. Mandy returned with her umbrella, uncompromisingly black and with two bent spokes. Here, love. I hope you won't be sorry. I won't hug you and muss your dress. She kissed me. Go now. I stepped onto the carpet and raised the umbrella. The coachman jumped down from his perch and opened the carriage door. <laughs>